Presenting the world's greatest mysteries. And now, your host. This is Basil Rathbone. On a street in Paris, there's a sign denoting the entrance to the offices of one of America's famous newspapers. Out through the entrance, many times has come one roving report of extraordinary. This has been his starting point for journeys to the capitals and villages of Europe. His aim has been to investigate, to search into, to find the secrets behind those mysteries that result in front-page copy and make the headlines of this famous daily. In a moment, one such story. It carries Mike's byline, and he tells it the way he saw it. Presenting Europe Confidential. Mike. Oh, Mike. He, he tried to kill no, me. No, it's all right. It's all right now. I killed him. Well, it wasn't your fault. Come on, let's go down. We got what we came for. <laughs> In a moment, we'll bring you Lionel Merton as Mike Canoy, the Paris correspondent of a famous American newspaper, in another exciting story in our series, Europe Confidential. I work in Paris for the American Chronicle, writing a column called Europe Confidential. All of us gamble at one time or another with a card or fall of a dice, speed of a horse, well, even the life of a man. In the newspaper business, we gamble to get a story, because in our philosophy, the story is what matters above everything else. Sometimes the gamble pays off, and sometimes it doesn't. I guess this is an example of, well, you judge for yourself. It started in Paris at the Chronicle office when I had a visitor, a genial small-time crook by the name of Jacques. Good night. Jacques, the gendarme of delight. What are you doing here? I have important business to sign back with you. Well, I'm not buying information on the black market this week, thanks. No, 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 no. You buy nothing. Oh? No? At times in the past, I do favors for you. Now, I ask a return favor. Yeah. What is it? You know, my friend, Pierre Marron. Big Pierre? The cat burglar the cops could never catch? Oui. But now they never will. He died this morning. Oh. Well, that's too bad, Jack. Anything I can do? Listen to me, monsieur. Before he died, Pierre asked me to remove a great stain from his immortal soul. Oh? He was afraid that when he entered the next world... Yeah, well, look, he... Jack, you've come to the wrong guy. I've got no influence in those regions. Mac. Pierre Marron gave me this note. He asked me to take it to... to the police. Well, I understand your reluctance. You could always mail it. Oh, yes, I could, but I promised it will be given in person. 
Hmm. Monsieur Mike, how can I go to the police? Interest me. Uh, Jacques, I'm surprised at you. Big Pierre was your friend and colleague. This is a last trust. Ah, uh, oui, but the police, <laughs> they are not my friends. Could you not deliver the note for me? I am afraid. <laughs> Here, let me see the note. See? Hmm. Well, I don't know why you should be worried about this. Hmm. Well? Hmm. Oh, well. Jacques, as you say, you've done me a favor or two in the past, uh, given me information, told me where I could locate guys. Um, I'll take care of Pierre's note for you. Ah, merci, merci, mon ami. You will take it to the police, huh? Eventually. Don't worry, Jack. Don't worry about a thing. When I'd ushered the grateful Jacques out of the room with as much courtesy as my eagerness would permit, I sat down and studied this note more carefully. Seventeen years ago, the note explained, in a little French town of Léon, Pierre Maron had killed a man. And this note was his confession, a complete account of how he had permitted an innocent man, someone named Henri Dubois, to be accused of this murder. It explained that Pierre had hidden signed affidavits proving Dubois' innocence somewhere in Léon. Just where in Léon, he neglected to say. The police would be interested in this confession, of course. But then it seemed to me that before it went to the gendarmes, here was a story handed to me on a platter. All I had to do was dig for facts. So I started to do just that later the same day. I went to an oversized house in an exclusive district of Paris and met two lovely ladies, one old, one young, both of them named Dubois. Ah, an American from a newspaper. Um, I write a column for the Chronicle. Ah, yes. We sometimes take the Chronicle, monsieur. But I don't understand. You said you had some document that concerns my husband. I don't think you can have anything of value for us, monsieur. Wait, please. Let the young man speak. Uh, the document concerns Henri Dubois. He was your husband. Ah, yes. But Henri is dead. Uh, madame, how long has it been? Uh, since his death, I mean. Well, we, we don't know. Not for certain. It has been a long time. Well, you needn't be delicate on my account, madame. I know. You know? Well, mademoiselle, I know that your father was accused of murdering a man in Léon 17 years ago. He did not. Henri would never hurt anyone. He was not a criminal. Well, I'm afraid the police don't share that view. When he escaped from prison before his trial, it seemed to clinch the case against him. Clinch? Well, it made the authorities even more certain of his guilt. I've read the newspaper files. The case made a splash, even here in Paris. But he had to escape. There was no hope without the paper. Yes, yes, I know. You seem to know so much, monsieur. Well, I know what you know, mademoiselle. Those papers were the evidence that could have saved your father. They were stolen. This does not help us. We have searched for 17 years for some kind of evidence that would have cleared the name of my husband. We have spent thousands of fines. Thousands. What if you found that evidence now, madame? Oh, my dear, if we only could. Madame, mademoiselle, those papers, they were affidavits proving absolutely that your husband was nowhere near the scene of the crime when it occurred. They were? How do you know this? I have the word of the man who stole them. You have? Oh, please. I knew that someday... The affidavits, mademoiselle. They're hidden somewhere in the town of Léon. It may take a great deal of searching, but, well, I'm willing to try. Oh, if you could find evidence to clear my husband, you can ask for anything you wish. I'll ask for just one thing, Madame Dubois. Anything. The right to this story. Exclusive. All the photographs I need, your personal story... And your daughters. But, Mama... You have my word. You can put our private lives on your front pages. If only you find proof that my husband was innocent. Yeah. Oh, hello, Duffy. Sure, I'm just about ready to check out. Oh, don't worry. I'll call you from Leon. Yeah, just as soon as I strike any oil. There's somebody at the door. I've got to go. Yeah, I know. Yeah, an editor's job is a thankless one. Well, cheer up. I'll buy you a drink at the press bar when I get back. Goodbye. Come in. Bonjour, Monsieur. Ah, oh, mademoiselle. You don't mind if I come in? 
Well, you seem to be in. Uh, what's this? Last minute instructions? Not exactly. I thought you would be leaving soon, and I was anxious to get here in time. Uh, any particular reason? I am coming with you. You're on our way a minute. Is uh, there any particular reason why I should not? Well, I can think of several. You mean that uh, what I am suggesting is not done? Well, that's for a start. And then there's Mama. I have the... discussed this with Mama. She's in full agreement that I should go with you. Besides, I have a car outside. It is so much more comfortable than traveling by the railway. <laughs> you know, you're beginning to break down my objections. <laughs> All right, but you'll have to pack in a hurry. Now, you go on home and get ready. No need to. My luggage is downstairs, waiting in the car. Well, how could I go on arguing after that? Besides, two's company, and the company was definitely a dog. Our first glimpse of Léon was from a hill behind the city. The red tile of the rooftops glistened in the warm sunlight. A quiet little mountain town that was incapable of coping with giddy tourists on expense accounts. As we entered Léon, I wondered how murder, misdirected justice, and hidden evidence could possibly fit within its limits. Clever, Mike. You've taken us directly to the center of town. Well, I couldn't miss, honey. Only one road into the place. Is that a hotel over there? Oh, it is the hotel. Hmm. That must be the town's official greeter. Out you go. Oh, merci. Oh, good uh, surprise. Please, good travel. Spare me a few francs. I will watch the car for you. My mother is ill, my family dying of hunger. Good sir, please help me. We'll watch the car, Mike. Yeah, official greeter. There's one in every town. <laughs> <laughs> His family starving, the old, old story. Oh, huh? let's give him a few pints. Huh? Go away. Get out of here. Good sir, please help me. Good mm. sir. Looks like the greeter was just sent into retirement. Your pardon, monsieur, madame. Welcome to Leon. You will find the hotel very comfortable. A, a beautiful room I have for you. <laughs> Followed the little manager across the tiled lobby and up the rickety stairs. I guess it was as well he'd never had any competition. Otherwise, Leon's leading hotel might have been out of business. And the sleepiness of a town is welcome sometimes. Leon was even sleepier than most small French towns. At night, when you'd expect it to come to life, it didn't. It remained sleepy as before. Good for the nerves. Unless you were trying to awaken a memory 17 years old. Pierre Marron? 17 years ago. He lived here. Big Pierre, he was called. Mm, no, I don't know this man. 17 years, monsieur, that is a long time. Yeah, we began to find it out after a solid 12 hours of covering bars and the cafes. We began to find out that 17 years is maybe just too long. Some people had heard of Big Pierre in Paris, but... Nobody remembered him in Léon. We split up and tried alone, then teamed up again, without anything good to report. Did you find anything, Mike? Oh, nothing. Tough job. Perhaps we're making a mistake. What about my father? Huh? It would be easier to find someone who remembers him. We can start from there. Are you out of your mind? Mention your father's name. Just, just mention it around here, and you'll have not only the police down on us, but... We'll have every cheap confidence man in the place on our hands trying to find out what we want. Plus the newspaper men. But we have to stop somewhere. Yeah, we have to rest somewhere, too. My feet are killing me. Let's go back to the hotel, huh? Mike... Mike, what are we going to do? Keep plugging. But it seems so hopeless. It would be better if we started finding people who knew my father. I told you, that would bring every news hound in France buzzing around here if the word got out. That's more important to you, isn't it, than clearing my father's name? Your story. It's the only thing that matters. Sit down. You don't even care. I said sit down. <sighs> no, that's better. Oh, Mike, what can we do? <gasps> oh, now, come on. There's nothing to cry about. I, I'm sorry. I, I can't help you. Here, come here. Come on. Mike, please. No. You know, you're a very lovely girl, Louise. No, Mike. Somehow I kind of hope this search of ours isn't too successful too soon. Well, things improved in Leon during the next few days. The warm, pleasant evenings. Louise. Yeah. 
But during the hot, tedious days, we searched and searched and searched. After one of our times together, I left Louise at her door and headed for my room. When I opened the door, there was a surprise waiting. I had a guest, the wizened old beggar who'd been the first to greet us on our arrival in Lyon. His greeting this time was a little violent. Oh! I have been waiting for you. Hey, what? What? What, you? No, no, you don't. Who the devil? You try to kill me. You die. You? What are you doing here? Come on now, what do you want? No. Panhandling business falling off? Robbing hotel rooms now, eh? <laughs> well, we'll see what the cops have to say about this. No, not, not the police. All right, let's have it. What's it all about? You come to kill me. What are you babbling about? Who wants to kill you? Pierre Merrill. You look for big Pierre. You come to kill me. Pierre? What's he got to do with it? Hey, hey, come back here, you. Pierre? Pierre? It was like a flash of light. Yeah. Suddenly in that crummy hotel room I knew. Henri Dubois. The beggar. The wizened old car-watching beggar. This was Louise's father. Buried in the dust of police records, rumors, and memory, but still alive after all these years. I had a story now, and what a story. I had a girl who didn't even know her own father. His identity buried under a scraggy beard in the guise of a beggar. Yeah, and a father who didn't even know his own daughter. Oh, I had a story, all right. Better than that, I had a chance to clear a 17-year-old miscarriage of justice. But it could only be done one way. It could only be done by finding those affidavits. And until they came to light, it would be pointless and pretty dangerous to tell Louise the truth about her father. Mike, I thought we could go... Mike! It's all right. Come in. Close the door. What happened? A little argument with destiny. <laughs> I won. Your clothes, they're all torn, and your face. Oh, oh Mike... No, there's nothing I can't wash off with soap and water. But what was it? The old car park beggar. What? He must have been after my dough. He tried to kill me when I caught him at it. Oh, Mike, you must be careful. We should go to the police. No, no, no. I don't want to talk to the police until we clear your father. If there's any further trouble, I can handle him myself. That night, there was no sleep. My head ached from the blow and from the thoughts that were tossing around in my mind. Where were those papers? Was Dubois himself searching for them? Had he been here in Lyon ever since people presumed him dead? Should I go to the police and turn over what I knew? Somewhere outside my window, the church bell was ringing mournfully, incessantly. I guessed it. And the torrent of thoughts kept me awake, oh, almost until dawn, and then I finally slept. Bonjour, monsieur. Yeah, where's Louise? The, the mademoiselle, where is she? Uh, at church, monsieur. Church? Oui. This is the patron's holy day in our town. At midnight, the bell begins to toll and does not stop until the sun sets tonight. You mean to tell me it's going to keep up that racket till sundown? That horrible noise, that clankety-clank? This clank, monsieur, it is the will of le bon Dieu. Yeah, I need some coffee. Our punishment, monsieur. We atone on this day for the great sin of Léon. Yeah, it must have been a whopper. Oh, a terrible sin, monsieur. On this day, 17 years ago, a man was killed in Léon. Mm -hmm. For this, Le Bon Dieu removed the music from the bell. It was... Wait a minute. What happened 17 years ago? There was murder in our city, monsieur. And the bell? A miracle. This bell was once of glorious musical tone. Then there came this terrible sin, this killing. Yeah, yeah. One of the men of Léon was taken by the police for this murder. Then there occurred this miracle. What miracle? Music left the tone of the bell, and this man was never seen again. He escaped. Some say he is dead. It changed its tone overnight, eh? Uh, before the man was brought to trial? The will of the Lord, monsieur. Our punishment for permitting violent death in our town. Each year on this day, we pray that the music be restored to our bell. You say you wish coffee, monsieur? Uh, no, no, not now. Uh, when the mademoiselle returns, tell her to see me at once. But, Mike, 
like it. It's, it's too fantastic. Of course it's fantastic. Bells don't change their tone the way you and I change our clothes. There's got to be a reason for it. A practical, fundamental, tangible reason. Look, this note. What? Pierre's note. Here, look. He admits it right here. He mm -hmm. stole the evidence that would have cleared your father. He says he hid it right here in Lyon. Why did he not destroy it immediately? Well, who knows? Maybe he intended to confess sooner or later. Murderers are seldom logical people. But look, now we learn that just before your father escaped from the police, the tone of this bell suddenly, mysteriously, miraculously, changed from a melodious ring to that clank that we hear out there. Listen to it, Louise. Listen, what makes a bell sound like that? I do not know, Mike. It, it may be... I don't know. Well, neither do I. But tonight, when this town crawls into bed, I'm going to find out. And you're going to help me. It was midnight before the streets were empty. Louise and I entered the little church and climbed the ancient flight of stairs to the tower. Quiet now. How will you get to the bell? The steps do not go that high. I have to use the bell pull. Here. Can you reach it? Yeah. Yeah, I've got it. I climbed hand over hand. I don't know how far. Ten feet, maybe fifteen. For a man in my doubtful physical condition, it wasn't easy. The bell made a horrible racket over me, and the sound grew in waves as I approached it, making me dizzier and dizzier until I almost let go. Finally, there was no more rope. My hand touched the inside of the bell, and it stopped ringing. The Malby confidence was at a cockeyed angle, and slipping away fast when I suddenly grabbed for the clapper and found what I wanted, a heavy oilskin wrapper tied around it, a bundle of the missing affidavits. One good tug pulled it away and I stuffed it in my shirt front. Help me! Help! Louise! Oh, the rope burned chunks of flesh right out of my hands as I slid down. Below me I saw another figure struggling with Louise, trying to get past her. The two of them were wrestling on a narrow ledge at the top of the steps leading from the church itself. I caught one moonlit glimpse of their faces as I swung onto the ledge. It was the beggar, Dubois, Louise's father. I, I want those papers. They kill you. Before I could reach them, she got one arm free and hit him as hard as she could. Then she shoved and he went over. Ah! Louise, Louise. Oh, Mike. Oh, Mike, he tried to kill me. He tried to kill me. It's all right. It's all right, honey. It's all right now. But I killed him. But it wasn't your fault. <laughs> Come on, let's go down. We've got what we came for. <laughs> No man can die twice. Henri Dubois was considered dead. The man who fell from the bell tower was a nameless beggar who had come to an unfortunate end. I could have told the authorities otherwise. It might even have made a better story. But I was through meddling in the lives of the Dubois family. Sure, we printed the facts the affidavits gave us, and it cleared Henri Dubois's name and made his widow and daughter very happy. But I kept wondering how different the ending might have been. Had I gone to the police when I knew the beggar's real identity? Or even had I looked back that night and seen him following us, knowing we were on the trail of the evidence he wanted? Yeah, how different the ending might have been. Mike, it's going to be wonderful when we get back to Paris. So much has happened. I've been so lucky. Lucky? My father's name has been cleared, and I've found you. Oh? I love you so much, Mike. Do you mind if I say that? No, I don't mind a bit, as long as you're not serious. What? I said I don't mind, as long as you're not serious. Not joking. You think so? Love isn't for the roving kind like me, Louise. Mike! That's nah, a big zero. Nothing. Short-term romance is more my line. Oh, I don't believe you. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. You see, this was an assignment. It was very pleasant, and we had fun together, but it's all over but now. You're fooling! Not a bit. Stop the car, will you? You do not mean a word. I said stop the car. I don't understand, Mike. I... There's nothing to understand. A story's a story. You're letting a romantic diversion confuse the issue. But where are you going? To Paris, without any strings. It's been great fun, Louise. I'll see you around someday. We'll have a drink in the Carlton Bar. Oh, what a fool I've been. Au revoir, Mike. Or perhaps it's adieu. Adieu, Louise. I guess I was the fool. It could have been such a different ending.
You have been listening to Lionel Merton as Mike Canoy in another exciting episode in the series, Europe Confidential. This is Basil Rathbone again. Well, that was Mike's story. This roving reporter friend of ours certainly has what I think the journalistic profession calls a nose for the news. I'll be back again with another of these mystery adventures, and I hope you'll join me. A goodbye now till we meet again to listen to another of the world's greatest mysteries. <laughs>